Hello. Ooh. Microphone. I am very excited to be here today. It's super nice to get to have a few days in the Pacific Northwest. I live down in Los Angeles now, but um, I went to college in Portland and then lived in Seattle for a few years while I wrote up my dissertation about bicycling in Los Angeles. So um, this region has played a, a big role in my thinking about what I'm doing with bicycling, how does it relate to racial justice work and culture change. So thanks for having me. What I want to talk about today is the process that I've been going through, we've all been going through our own processes of understanding what the world is like that we're living in and doing our activism in today, um, and how I've been finding meaning in bicycling, and what opportunities I think there are for the bike movement um, in, the, in the current moment. Two days after the election last November, I flew from my home in Los Angeles to Atlanta for two racial justice conferences. I was a co-organizer of one of them, which we named the Untokening. The Untokening grew out of years of networking among people of color biking and walking advocates. Our goal for this gathering was in the name. Many of us had struggled with tokenism in advocacy spaces that reflect our country's legacy of racial segregation. We know what it's like to be the only in a room, and we know how little room that gave us to speak our own minds. So what would it be like to spend some time untokening, scraping away the awkwardness that comes with feeling out of place, and participating in dialogue about the street problems as we know them in our own communities? Today, active transportation advocacy focuses primarily on policy solutions for changing transportation. With the untokening and some of the other projects I've been involved in, we're instead trying to return to movement building, spending more time creating an environment where solutions to different sustainability, uh, sustainable mobility problems can emerge. We're really inspired by the environmental justice movement, which since the 1980s has challenged environmental movements overall to expand their agendas and cultures to connect with the realities of communities of color. A bigger movement makes for bigger change. This is the idea, that being able to include more people in how we understand active transportation, how we understand streets, is going to have bigger effects for everybody. So to signal our intention to move beyond tokenism in biking and walking advocacy, we designed the untokening to be a majority people of color space, with two-thirds of our registration slots available only to people of color. And we were a parasite conference on a much bigger racial justice event, uh, a conference called Facing Race that is put on by an organization called Race Forward every few, few years. This is my first time going to Facing Race, and I was glad to have the opportunity to see how people were talking about uh, multiracial work in that space. I heard a lot of people describing distrust across racial divides. And, you know, I thought about that many times before, so I, I thought for the umpteenth time about how it's really challenging to build trust in a segregated society where so many of us have grown up in environments where we're simply not that exposed to people who are different from us. Who makes overtures across these divides, and how are they received on the other side? Because I thought about this stuff a lot in my years as a bicycle anthropologist, it kind of surprised me when I felt a strong reaction at Facing Race to hearing a young Latino man express his frustration about being expected to collaborate with white people. Why should he have to work with people he saw as the problem, as the enemy? How is that a path toward liberation? I got up and left the room, fuming at the invisibility of part white people like me. I don't have a choice about collaborating with white people. They're my family, they're my friends. These are things that I thought about many times before in the past few years of working on racial justice, but somehow being mixed felt really disorienting after the election. Because I could see the validity of the outrage and the sense of betrayal and the sad acknowledgement on the other side that this was nothing new for an unequal society. We hadn't been living in some utopia under Obama, who immigrants' rights groups had dubbed the deporter in chief. There was no Garden of Eden that had been defiled by the spread of red across the map on election night. But everything felt upside down and hostile. Everything was new, and it was the same old problem at the same time. I've had a lot of experience with crossing racial divides because I grew up in a Mexican immigrant enclave, half Mexican, close to my white mother's family, in a region politically dominated by white conservatives. So I'm pretty pretty familiar with what it's like to, to navigate these different spaces. Um, but for the past few years, I'd really been focusing more on what it was to be a woman of color working in active transportation. 
all of a sudden in the world that we woke up to on November 9th, it somehow seemed important that I was half white. Somehow my whiteness reared its head and, and I started thinking of myself as part of a, a white culture and white community for the first time in, in a few years. I saw my whiteness in a new light in terms of that trust problem across racial divides. And it made me realize that I can navigate white culture in a way that people who didn't grow up with it don't know how to do. I know the sugar that sometimes coats ugly ignorance. I know how to stay on the surface and be pleasant and make my brown skin into nothing more than a suntan, not a sign of my alien knowledge of other worlds. I know how to gauge the trustworthiness of white people because I understand where they're coming from. But if you didn't grow up around white people, what internal sensors did you have that helped you gauge whether a menace was present? If you don't grow up in white culture, how can you tell a bigot from someone who's well-meaning? I've heard this discussed on the flip side. For example, non-black people who are unfamiliar with black culture seeing all black, man, black men as a threat. But it wasn't until facing race that I grasped that I'm not all on the other side. I, I didn't just grow up experiencing white power as a threat while also being seen as somebody who was threatening. So maybe this is what that frustrated young man I heard was rejecting. He wasn't really even talking about rejecting white individuals. He was talking about rejecting this feeling of distrust that he's always had to live with and not knowing how to do good work in a space where that feeling of, of distrust was going to be present. So this really means we, we don't get to operate with ideal conditions for doing multiracial work, and yet that is where we are. So the more we can kind of grasp that, I think the better. So the day after Facing Race, about 130 of us spent a day in conversation and community building at the Antokening. And I was, I mean, I was in the heart of my community at that event. It was the most diverse active transportation advocacy event I've ever seen. But unfortunately, it felt a little flat. Because all, all of a sudden our work seemed less important in the face of big trouble looming on the horizon, which I'm sure is a feeling that a lot of us uh, have had in the last few months. So just being away from home felt insecure in that time. I had almost canceled going to the untokening because I just didn't want to get on an airplane and, and leave Los Angeles, but I knew I had to be there. It was something that I'd been central in organizing. But uh, I also lost a lot of enthusiasm for what was supposed to be a, a fun cap to that conference trip. After the untokening, I flew from Atlanta to Minneapolis so that I could drive to Sioux City, Iowa to find my great-great-grandfather's grave. He was a Norwegian immigrant who took the name James Holmes when he passed through Ellis Island with his wife Thea and their children in 1873. While my sister Gia has traced family history to Minnesota and Wisconsin, this link to Sioux City was more recently uncovered. We'd always known that our great-grandfather, who was born Lars Jensen, but then renamed Lawrence Holmes, had been an entrepreneur and rancher in California in the early 1900s, but what we hadn't known was that he hadn't come alone. He came over with his whole family, and there were five siblings of his who made the trek out west. In November 2015, I visited my great-great-grandmother Thea's grave for the first time. It turned out that she was buried less than three miles from my home in L.A., uh, lying since 1913, uh, buried on a hill that now overlooks the 10 freeway. We don't have living memories from this genealogy due to what seems to be a, a Holmes family penchant for rifts. Uh, my grandfather had disowned my mother when she married my dad because he was Mexican. And even though he eventually forgave her for that, they were never close after that, as you can imagine. So it was really fun to be digging into this family history that we hadn't really known about because there wasn't anybody to tell us about it and to find these connections both close to my home in LA and in other parts of the country I wasn't familiar with. So when I planned this trip, I expected to really just enjoy exploring a new landscape and think about what it was like for these Norwegian immigrants to go from living among the fjords to living on the plains. But now that I was actually going through with the road trip, uh, I felt like I was out on a limb. I would left my, my blue city and my blue state to drive alone through rural Minnesota and Iowa. And what business did I have here? A brown woman whose mestizo features overshadow the evidence of my descent from European immigrants. All of a sudden it felt more important to find my roots here, to be able to prove that people like me have been part of this country all along. But I had to travel through hostile territory to do it.
I pulled into Floyd Cemetery on the industrial outskirts of Sioux City at about noon on a Tuesday. It's a city park, so there was no office to visit, nobody to help me find the grave, but there was a map at the front that gave me a starting point. My sister had found the grave plot on an online registry, so I knew which coordinates to be, to be looking for. There's nobody else in the cemetery, which stretched from a narrow opening to cover several hillsides and a ravine, so it was just a big old, beautiful 19th century space. The sun and wind made it a golden day, and the fall leaves swirled along the irregular rows of monuments and old trees. According to the map, James's plot was near the entrance, so I parked my rented car, getting ready to walk back and forth among the graves until I found his headstone. But a cursory inspection yielded no results, so I called my sister Gia to get her help. I put her on speakerphone, and I'm walking around the graveyard, and to get me to the right section, we played a game where I read her the name from a grave, and she told me its section number from the online registry. We got warmer and warmer and closer to triangulating where the grave should be until we definitely located the section where James's name should have been, and there was nothing. There were other families' plots on two sides and an empty patch in between. I'd seen a number of broken stones, so maybe his gravestone had fallen over at some point in the last hundred plus years, so I kept walking back and forth and scanning the ground for evidence of something, an old foundation that had lost its marker, but I couldn't find it. Minor cord whistles drifted up from the train yards below the cemetery from time to time, and some maintenance vehicles passed through the graveyard. Besides that, it was just me and the voice of my big sister thousands of miles away. I went down to the map at the entrance again to see if I'd gotten off course somehow, and Gia called the Sioux City Parks Department to see what she could learn. A few minutes later, she conferenced me into a call with a man named Tim. We weren't wrong, he said. It's just that fewer than half the people interred in Floyd Cemetery are uh, buried there anymore. So somewhere near Anna Kern and John Anderson, who lie in family plots, somewhere near Julia Steers, who seems to be alone in a large plot, somewhere near Maria Foley, lies James Holmes, who died April 8, 1893. After Tim hung up, Gia listened while I kicked through piles of leaves, still hoping to find some trace. I'd come a long way. The wind picked up the leaves and blew them past me, and disturbed spiders skittered around. There was no way of knowing if there had once been a marker and it broke over the years. One wall of a family plot had broken, which showed that subsidence could have damaged a nearby stone. Or maybe he'd never had a stone, because some Holmes family bad blood prevented it. It was anticlimactic. I wanted to see hard evidence that my family's immigration to this country is part of the same story as the Trump voters who think there's some America to protect from elements like me. I've seen it in the Californian graves of my grandmother's family, but suddenly it felt important to be able to say that I had roots in this Midwestern place. A brown woman like me has roots in that past too, and I sure as heck plan to have a future in my country. With these barriers to belonging in the big American story cutting us apart right now, with so much making us feel like the ground has turned to quicksand, it's more important than ever to think about what brings us together and where we stand. And for me, that comes together in bicycling. Bicycling for me has been a movement, the collective vision of many individuals. It encourages a transformative understanding of our individual use of resources, grounding our travel and our own energy output. Bicycling is a form of individual resistance against toxic and exploitative systems, and I believe that bicycle advocacy can be a form of organized resistance. But we'll do a better job of changing conditions for other people when we understand our own strengths and limitations as a movement. So here are some opportunities that I see. We have something really important to offer to the broader movement for building a better world. We have this thing, this practice that we do, that gives us a solid connection between individual power and social change. We know what it's like to feel powerful in our own bodies, to climb hills, to coast down, and we're motivated to share that experience with other people. I'd love us uh, to figure out how bicycling can give activists across the spectrum in all sorts of different social movements a sense of power in the face of dismantled social protections. There's a lot of people who are hurting right now and feeling extremely disappointed because the policy work that they've worked on for decades and put their best energy into is just getting taken apart in front of their faces and people need action, people need something they can do. And we happen to have a pretty good drug for uh, feeling like you can get places. It's gonna take some strategizing because for various reasons, 
Lots of people who don't bike think that we're annoying because we do, but uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be pretty cool to figure out how we can learn to share that feeling we get from riding. And I don't really mean converting more people into being bicycle advocates. It's like somehow getting to what is it that, that, that fuels us in riding and how can that be an asset for social movements? What's the thing that, that gets us going to our bikes and going back to our bikes even in the face of not having a perfect ride? Um, and, and how can we turn that little thing into something that works for other people as well? Another opportunity that's very relevant to Washington is the tremendous technical and legislative expertise that bicycle professionals have built up. Um, if we invest in doing that movement building work and being in spaces where we work on getting to know each other, spending more time together, we'll develop an understanding of our own challenges and barriers uh, that are embedded in the strategies that we've chosen as advocates. Uh, and we'll be able to come up with some more holistic solutions, more inclusive, more equitable. What matters is really connecting at that interpersonal level, rather than just in structured decision-making spaces. And I think that there are great examples in this state of social events around bicycling and clubs and people spending time together riding. I think that's a great thing to expand on. This is where the culture change in our own movement can happen, is in these movement spaces. We should rise above the xenophobia and hate that are corroding American culture right now and spend more time together. Co-presence builds familiarity, which is the only thing that's going to lead to trust. For me, that's taking the shape of talking to more people about transportation and culture change in general, rather than trying to convince them that my choices are the best ones. I'm really lucky that I've gotten to spend uh, many years studying this movement. But I encourage all of us at all levels, regardless of whether you work for government, whether you're a community activist, a professional advocate, to take the time to reflect on what is in our power and what's not, and how expanding what is ours and who we are will give us more understanding of how we can resist oppression and fight for the better world we know when we're out on a ride. Thank you.